Tides. I hope you're having a great week and a great new year. Today we will be talking to our JROTC program. Check it out. Well, I've been here at Beach High. This is uh, going halfway through my third year. I've been in ROTC though since I retired from the Navy and I retired from the Navy in 2007 uh, after 30 years in the Navy. JROTC, uh, you know one of the things I want to emphasize, a lot of people don't understand, it's not a recruiting program for the military. JROTC will provide you great opportunity if you were interested in going in the military, but uh, you're certainly not in the military. Now, how big it is here at the Miami Beach High School, I think we're about 140 or so, give or take a couple, 140 or so students here. It's a nationwide program, so you could, if you move to Los Angeles, you could still be in a Navy Junior ROTC. Because yeah. we get to compete with all those, those different school units from around the country. We can either compete online or within the area, excuse me, in Florida. We go to field meets and so forth to compete against units from as far away as towards Jacksonville or uh, in, on the west coast of the, of the state. So pretty pretty competitive program that way too. If you're not interested in a military career, there are still some tremendous benefits. The, the leadership and management experiences that a cadet could have in here if he was a four-year member. Think of it like a leadership laboratory. We're, we've tried to create a work environment within the school, a you know, work culture. This case, In this case, <clears throat> Instead of being a, a business, it's a military organization. All well, military organizations wear uniforms, so uh, it helps build cohesiveness and teamwork. We are pretty much all <clears throat> potentially dressed the same, look the same, have the same basis of knowledge. It's the principal reason behind it. it shows some basic discipline and organization to wear a uniform right, look good in it, and uh, kind of distinguish yourself that way. And of course, it brings great credit to the United States Navy. They manage all the activities and there are quite a few from community service to the uh, drill meets we run. They organize the field trips. Basically, uh, I haven't summarized it well enough, the students do everything in here. I just kind of mentor them and make sure it's all, you know, st stay between the lines. But as much as we could possibly make it, this is a student-run organization. My name is Leron Brady. Uh, I'm the commanding officer of the JHC program and uh, I am currently a senior. I am Augustine Rakazada. I am also a senior and I'm the executive officer, the lieutenant commander, so I'm right under him. The point of being a leader is to, is to teach them your qualities, teach them how you act. And you know, my leadership quality is not for people to follow me, it's not for people to act like me. My, my quality and my, my, my overall perspective for all my cadets is to be better than me. If I know that my cadets, even down to the very last cadet who can be you know, a cadet seaman recruit, uh, as long as they're all better than me, that means I've done my job very well. Normally people after they leave ROTC, they, they live a lifestyle that everyone else lives, either becoming a doctor, becoming you know, a police officer, joining the military, and you'd be surprised out of, let's say, 100% of the people that joined the program, there's a solid 40, maybe even 45 that joined the military. Because, you know, it's not, it's not designated to, oh, you're gonna join the program, you're gonna go to the military. It's just to teach you leadership in a general manner. The main reason why I joined the program was because back then I wasn't so bright as a student, as one would say. I wasn't really, you know, the kind of student you'd go to for advice or, you know, things like that. So one of my friends, he told me, hey, look, you should join this program. You know, it might change you. And believe it or not, it actually did like tremendously. Our very own High Tides produced a high-end performance this week. And Parvati was there to check it out. My name is David Nardone, and I'm the drama teacher and director of the play. Hi, my name is Catherine Verblude, and I will be playing Anne Frank. Hello, my name is Blue O'Brien, and I'll be playing the character of Peter Van Dan. I'm Luke Druckmann, and I play Mr. Crawler. Hi, my name is Irio Nunez, and I play one of the Nazis in the Anne Frank play. I always loved the story. I always thought of Anne Frank as a role model. It's a very motivate, motivational play for actors. I'm Jewish, so the whole situation is really important to me. It talks about intolerance and hatred towards others, and I think it's very timely. Because it tells the story of 
Holocaust and World War II and going into hiding and what it's like for Jews through the eyes of a 13-year-old girl. And that makes it even more real than it already is. Anne Frank is a small story amongst uh, many, many stories of the Holocaust. And I think it's important because it shows like not only all the bad parts, but also the good parts, like the Hanukkah scene where they're all giving each other presents. It's sincere and genuine. With history, it's better to know what has occurred so that you don't repeat. So that it never happens again. Because it's a big piece of history and we don't want that reoccurring. So we do not have to repeat history. So it's not repeated. That way we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. It shows a very discriminational period and that was not good for America, for Europe at all, for the whole world really. It's a learning process. The Holocaust hasn't affected me. The only way it's affected me is that I've learned more about it and I've become aware of it. I have family members, like great, my great grandma's family died in the Holocaust and their names are in the Holocaust Memorial and it's really important to me. It hasn't. It's amazing to think that something so terrible can happen in history and I hope it never happens again. We can't afford to discriminate people for any differences. I don't understand why it exists. It's hateful and it's honestly disgusting. Like, why should you treat people differently just because they're Jewish? Like, it, everyone's equal. It is discrimination against Jews, it is being racist, and it's not equality like it should be. They give us, the people, the common folk, power, and they also keep us safe and protected within, the, within whatever government we're a part of. Because it's right to be civil. It gives everyone the equality. It's equal respect for everyone. Racism. Everyone gets to be treated the same, and should be treated the same no matter what race, religion, gender, age. I mean, everyone should be treated the same way. A great performance by all. This weekend we have a three-day weekend due to one man and that's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let's see what our high tides have to say about equal rights. It's January. Let's talk about Dr. King. Hold on, that's not good. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Born January 15th, 1929. Killed April 4th, 1968. He was an American Baptist minister, meaning he was a pastor, a shepherd. Yeah, he worked with sheep, but they kind of speaks. Anyways. He was an activist, humanitarian, and leader in the African-American civil rights movement. He's best known for his role in advancement of civil rights using nonviolent civil disobedience based on his Christian beliefs. Most importantly, on October 14, 1964, Dr. King received the Nobel Peace Prize for combating racial inequality through nonviolence. Now let's hear the word of the people. What comes to mind with the words Martin Luther King? Rest in peace. Thank you for everything you've done for the people of the United States and for the people of the earth, of the world. I think of a uh, revolutionary. Black people. One of the greatest human beings who ever lived and did a lot for our country and the people who live in it today. What comes to mind, obviously, the civil rights movement and its progression. Montgomery bus boycott all the way through Birmingham and all the South and then the lunch counter boycotts and of course the, the famous speech, the uh, March on Washington in 63. Uh, what is he talking about? King was strongly against violence. He even vowed not to use his arms at a certain point. His way of protesting was standing or sitting in places for hours, even days or longer, boycotting, sabotaging. He was a motivator. One of the great Americans uh, that changed this country dramatically. Uh, he got shot. Yeah, he was shot. Uh, yeah, he got assassinated. He was actually killed by a white man. James Earl Ray, while standing on the second floor balcony of the room 306 of the Lorraine Motel. I did visit where he was shot. I was on a trip up in Memphis and I was at the Lorraine Motel. But you can go there and they've turned that motel into a museum. You could see the balcony he was on. In fact, you could go across the street and see where the shooter was positioned. Me being my name, Martin, you know, actually I got called Martin Luther King a lot in, in elementary school, so I, I did a little reading on him, and uh, that's how I learned about Martin Luther King. Uh, in elementary school, I remember clearly, actually. My teacher, yeah. <laughs> I learned about him initially through school and through parades and events that happened, because I used to live in Chicago, which is predominantly African-American, but that's fine. Um, throughout school. I learned about Martin Luther King through the Martin Luther King book in the Martin Luther King Library.
in the Martin Luther King city, in the Martin Luther King state, next to the Martin Luther King country, right by the continent, Martin Luther King, MLK.com. You know what I mean? Honestly, I would say no. I, I believe that everybody should have equal rights, really. You know, it's a cliche, you know, oh, hey, everybody should have equal rights, but it's true, you know, women. They don't want you to be successful. They don't want you to make money like the rest of us. They don't want... I mean, according to the law, you do. But in a lot of places, unfortunately, uh, people don't see uh, people. They see skin color and ethnicity and language. So by law, it's it's uh, equal, but not, not... Equal rights are supreme. I don't even know what that is. Not... Yeah, I think I think when we say equal rights, we should understand what equality means. Not... Uh, there should be equal justice under law. You know, we're not all equal in our abilities. I don't think we have equal rights because a lot of people, like, we have, like, corrupt powers, like, like controlling us, you know? Like, words can, like, uh, achieve anybody's mind. So, like, you, I could say something and, like, they could follow me just because I sound smart, you know? So, like, I could turn anybody's mind into, like... <laughs> I mean, it does have equal rights to a certain extent. This country has equal rights because I get to in class without any hesitation i get to vibe in the back with the quad you already know how i'll be with the gang gang and like for example i know women start making the same amount that guys should i mean let's be honest like it doesn't mean anything like it does. no it doesn't it's like i could say my name is jesus i don't know much about jesus well you should you gotta you gotta give them the same amount of money that we make i mean just just because they don't have a dick, they shouldn't get like less money you know what i mean have a great weekend high tides and don't forget to follow your dreams